Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Crime Centric. This being a show where we talk about crime dramas that I watch. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about the latest episode of Blind Spot as well as the latest episode of The Blacklist. Like always, if I'm talking about something that you want to listen to, you can always look in the description down below. I include a time and I start talking about each of the respective shows. So, for example, if you want to hear what I say about this week's episode of Blind Spot, you can skip to what I say about this week's episode of The Blacklist. But the first thing I'm going to talk about is this week's episode of Blind Spot. A very good episode. A lot of interesting things went down in this episode. So um, it's kind of interesting because obviously Jane still kind of, you know, like I like that conversation between Reed and Kurt all dealing with kind of their new normals and stuff like that. Obviously, you know, Reed's looking over the whole situation with Tasha because he's the only one that knows because the only other person is Keaton and he's in a coma. So all of that pretty much rests on Reed's shoulders now. And then Kurt's trying to adjust everything that's going on with Jane, trying to give her a space. Obviously, not trying to be too overbearing, but obviously he cares and he's worried. So, but for Jane, it's also like you know her new normal of like dealing with the whole Remy situation. It's interesting because she made you know comparisons between like it's it, it felt one way like you know waking up in that bag having no memories, but having all the fighting skills and all the language she, you know she had access to, and not knowing where, what it was all connected to or who she was, and now. Every punch she throws, it makes it triggers a whole bunch of memories about all the previous punches she had thrown. It just becomes a little overwhelming. I mean, to be fair, literally her entire life is being, you know, slowly trickled down. I'm probably not even just slowly, but just like bombarding her with already, like, you know. It's kind of interesting because, you know, she spent so long wondering who she was. And I think there was a point where she just never cared anymore. Because I guess she found out, you know, when she found out about Remy and everything, she stopped caring. It's like, I'm Jane and that's all there is to it. But now she kind of has no choice but to remember all that is, you know, Remy. So what's interesting about this episode is that we have an author named uh, Winston Kill. And it's kind of interesting because... Uh, Rich is the one that brought the case to them, but then it's kind of like, oh, this might be tattoo related because he, some of the stuff like, you know, that he has all these reports and stuff and newspapers and stuff like that written on his, like on this wall that are basically connected to cases that they've done, uh, whether it be, you know, uh, you know, some of the, uh, politicians or high power people that they've taken down and stuff like that, but nothing directly linking them to, you know, it, it to them, them and their cases because of, like not even Jane's mention in it. But it turns out this dude is an author that uh, apparently he writes books that Kurt is very familiar with, and everyone's just look at him and just like even Jane poking fun of him, being like, "He's a super fan." He's like, "I'm not a super fan," but it's like, yeah, he types on a typewriter because it's just kind of easier. It makes you know, it's you know, it connects him to the words is what he said, and everyone's looking at him. He's like, "Okay, I might be a bit of a super fan," but it turns out that the book he's writing now is a that's incomplete is about a serial killer known as the New York Ripper and it's about Jane and the entire team and I love that the actors kind of had to act out stuff from the books and in scenes and stuff like that and it's so crazy and you know like even uh, Jane doing the whole thing it kind of reminded me of Sean from um psych every time he'd pretend to be a psychic that whole thing she's like wait i'm getting something like she was a psychic or something i love that uh because he didn't know all the details but he knew enough details to the point everyone's like he knows a little too much about us even the whole like scene where he had uh patterson and rich hooking up which was so awkward because there's it's just like you don't you can't see that happening but it's just it's so weird and funny because it's just like patterson's like but what about your wife he's like don't talk, let's not talk about my disinterested wife, and then just, like, her biting his finger, like, or biting at it like that, I'm like, it's so weird, because it's super cheesy, and just, because it's meant to be over the top, and I loved it, and then just, like, that's gotta be awkward for both of them, but I love, like, Rich being like, that's totally not me, the fact of the matter is, like, if I was married, I'd have multiple wives, um, but also, like, he knew exactly where Patterson hid her, like, celebratory uh, alcohol. So I thought that was kind of interesting. You know, that plays into it. And so what makes it real interesting is the fact is Patterson also got on Rich later on because he kept reading the book, even though it's like, it's like, there's, he was like, there's literally a typo in here. It says, I glove you. Obviously, that plays into a clue later on, but still. And Patterson's like, why are you still reading that, you know? Because they weren't even sure at that point in time whether it was actually going to be evidence or not. But I still thought that was so neat. I mean, sadly, the book never actually had an ending. I would have been so fascinated to actually find out what the ending to the book would have been. 
because it turns out the one behind all of this is uh, Brianna. Like, I, you know, uh, she that's so interesting because, like, the moment, like, Rich bumped into her in the episode, I was like, they made that into a, such a moment. I'm like, the moment it's like, oh, it's got to be someone in the office. I'm like, it has to be her then. Especially because in the story, she's written as the one of, like, oh, I see things differently than everyone else. So that was kind of interesting. And, like, how she, like... It's like, oh, yeah, you were written in a story as the hero who kind of helped solve everything. It's like, well, I guess that was Winston's way of paying her back for kind of giving him access to the knowledge that she knows about the office and stuff like that. So I'll go ahead and talk about it. That I didn't even I, I always feel I felt so messed up because like the moment the moment he was like, Re, Re was like, oh, yeah. So why wasn't Tasha in the book? I was like, she wasn't. Was she? Why didn't I notice that? I felt so shitty about that. that I didn't recognize that Tasha was not in the story at all. And it's like, oh, yeah, apparently Winston had a hard time writing her story because, like, he got to, you know, he knows a little bit about the team and stuff like that. He probably got to know a little bit about them personally and stuff like that. But the fact of the matter is, like, Tasha is very combustible, very self-destructive. For him, it's like he wanted to write a story where everyone would have a happy ending, but he just couldn't write one for Tasha um, or, you know, one for anyone that cares about her, which in turn means that there's never going to be a happy ending potentially for him and Tasha just because, like, obviously it's just written, it's story-wise, but at the same time, it's like, oh, man, that's kind of harsh. That's super sad and depressing that that's why she was not in the story, in the book. Because, like, apparently, because she even, because he even made a point, he was like, you've been talking to him for a year. It's not like it was over the past couple months when Tasha was gone. It's like, no, you were talking to him while Tasha was still in the office and stuff like that. And it's like, man, that's depressing. And I guess that is, supposed. I guess, and it's always very foreshadowing about Reed and Tasha's position. And I think that's what that's supposed to be. It's going to get Reed thinking about, like, okay, what about me and Tasha? Like, I mean, he's already at a point where he's kind of like, he did, I think he's still conflicted on how he feels about the whole Tasha situation. It's like, what we had is over, but I I think there's still something there, but to kind of probably hear that out loud, you know, it probably makes him a little concerned for her, you know, probably brings up in his own mind, like, what about me in the grand scheme of all of this? Like, where do I, you know, it's, it was just kind of an interesting thing. Like I said, sad, but interesting. I'm surprised that conversation ever come, came up when in the book it was like, oh yeah, you know, maybe Jane and Kurt had never read that far into it about them having a kid. I'm surprised that it didn't come up. I mean, to be fair, both of them have a kid. She has a daughter. He has one, too. So I get, you know, but they don't have one of their own necessarily. But it's like they're a family. So I guess, it, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't really matter. But still, uh, it turns out the New York Ripper behind all of this was a cop named Iris. At first, it seemed like it was uh, her stepbrother, Gerald. But everything pointed to her because, like, she apparently also does, like, these little uh, diagrams of, like, using rats and kind of positioning them. It's like a, what's it called? Is it Dinner with Schmucks? The Steve Carell, Paul Rudd movie, it seemed like it was kind of something similar to that. And that's what her whole thing is. Like, she basically brought her art to life with by killing people. It's like, oh, they're not victims. I'm immortalizing them in my art. They should be glad they're being celebrated in such a way. That was kind of her twisted message behind everything. But uh, what's really interesting is, like, sadly, around the same time, like, obviously, Jane's condition is kind of getting worse she's getting the, like you know the headaches and like her, her ears are messing up and then later on she starts losing her vision but even in that state of kind of in the process of losing her vision she still kicked and ended up killing iris which side note that actress seems so familiar i'm trying to remember what i know her from but that actress who plays iris in this like uh, the new york ripper I feel like I've seen her in something, and I just can't quite place it. I, don't, I, need, I need to look that up. Uh, but nevertheless, but this guy, I mean, that kind of shows you how badass Jane is, that even half blind, she still rocked it. But by the end, she's, like, losing her sight completely. And there was that almost, like, holy crap moment where, like, you know, Patterson and um, Richard walked in, and they saw Kurt standing there, and the bed was empty. He's like, wait, no. He's like, no, no, no. She had a seizure, but the fact of the matter is she's okay, you know. Uh, she's currently recovering, and I'm like, oh, like, the fact is that that was kind of a concern, like, you know, it's kind of like, you can tell that their heart skipped a beat at that second, like, well, wait, wait, you don't tell, you know, so, but sadly, her getting that seizure like she did, you know, her ears kind of giving out in her eyes, because Jane had associated this with what Patterson had said, that basically her body was starting to forget how to operate, so in this case, forget how to hear, forget how to see, and now it's like, oh, like, 
you know, she's running out of time. At this point, the zip poisoning has gotten to the point it's nearing the end to the point she's literally got days, maybe less left. And they're, you know, they're still looking for that material they need for uh, Roka to um, make a cure. And it's just this heartbreaking moment of just kind of like, holy crap, this is literally down to the wire to potentially find a cure for Jane, dude. It's going. It's a little depressing, so I I'm, I want to shift it up a little bit right here, but um, kind of make it a little more lighthearted. I uh, was the whole aspect of like how I was bringing up them acting like their characters from the stories. It's so interesting. Like I said, I feel like as the series has progressed, they've added like definitely like a wackiness to the show. They they made it very lighthearted in some regards, and I I feel like this season in particular, they really kind of played with kind of like the lightheartedness. I think that's kind of a nice little bounce. It, it's not like a complete takeover, but here and there kind of sprinkled into some of the story elements and stuff like that. I just think it's kind of like a neat choice that they've kind of been making as the series has progressed. But um, kind of focusing on something else that went down in this episode, there's the whole uh, Tasha situation getting grabbed by the CIA. I was like, okay, how the hell is that going to turn out? But uh, Dominic, one of uh, Madeline's people showed up and Tasha does point it out. It's like, you just happen to show up when I get kidnapped, I mean, he was more so looking out for the cartel potentially coming after her, but it was like, oh, you know. But it is kind of interesting because it almost seems like you waited for her to get grabbed. So I guess that was kind of the whole point, I guess, to see if there was anyone else he needed to take out or whatever. But nevertheless, uh, it's kind of interesting because Abado was like, okay, no, 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 no. I'm not leaving here without Del Toro because, you know, if I go back, Madeline's going to kill me anyway, you know. So it is that in itself, but also the aspect of, you know, she needs to get Del Toro because if she doesn't get Del Toro, Madeline's going to find someone else and get this stuff done on her own. It's like, you know, Tasha's trying to con keep some form of control in this craziness. But when she gets there, Del Toro backs out and stuff like that. Uh, just because it's like, oh, we're, things are supposed to be, you know, I set up a time and a place and you didn't come. So your person's going to have to find, your Madeline's going to have to find someone else. So what does Tasha do? She goes back and she lies to Dominic. It's like, yep. Del Toro gave me the phone, he's in, and it's like, oh, great. So I guess she's going to get someone else to play the role of Del Toro. I mean, Madeline knows about the team and stuff like that, but does she know about... I guess as long as Rich doesn't reveal his face, because I feel like it could either be Rich or Patterson who plays the role of Del Toro. Like, one of them is going to have to play that role and probably be like an automatic voice or something but Madeline might want to meet in person that might end up kind of being a potential uh, complication that might arise in that situation but it's like I'm curious to see how Tasha is going to cover that up I mean luckily Del Toro is one of the people that doesn't well eventually that's going to get found out because I'm sure like the cartel is going to find out like oh you're not working with her and then you know you know Madeline and the cartel probably be talking and it'll be like wait what He's a, what are you talking about? No, he took the job. It's going to be interesting to see how Tasha ends up playing this out because she's bought herself a little bit of time, but Madeline finds out Madeline will take her out quick. So it's going to be interesting to see how that all ends up playing out. It's interesting that that's all happening while Jane is literally, you know, n potentially nearing the end. And that's, like I said, kind of going back to uh, sad and uh, in that regard, but still. But I'm very excited to see what the next episode has in store for us with all of this. And now moving on to this week's episode of The Blacklist. A great episode. Holy crap, a lot of amazing things went down in this episode. So let's break it down bit by bit. It's interesting because, obviously because of the position that Reddington's in, being in jail, a lot of people that have invested in his business, you know, criminal empire and stuff like that, are getting a little antsy because it's like, yo, wait, 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 you're in prison? Like, oh, what if he rats on us? Which is like, Reddington doesn't do that. It's like, oh, you think Reddington's going to make a deal with the FBI is what Dinbay says? I'm like, that's funny. That's funny you said that, Dinbay. That's so good. A little wink and nod like that. I love that. But the fact of the matter is um, the sharks are um, circling. Because it's interesting. Because once again, this isn't the first time Reddington's been in a situation where like people are like, oh, you're weak. Now's the time to strike. It's it's happened before in the series. But this time, he's at even a bi even, even bigger disadvantage, a disadvantage. I'm stumbling on my words. I apologize. Because before, at least when he was kind of, you know, kind of out when it came to power, at the very least... 
he was, you know, out and about able to kind of do things himself. But because he can't make meetings himself, it has to be Dembe talking on his part. The fact of the matter is he's in a position of being in jail, kind of look, almost making him look weak, literally facing execute, uh, execution potentially. It kind of puts him in a whole new uh, situation. And it's a lot of interesting things. Um, in particular, it focuses on Harris. Interestingly enough, um... I feel like he's popped up before because I feel like I've made this whole thing about like, oh, yeah, the actor who played uh, Harris in this is the same actor who plays Milton, you know, in um, Netflix's show uh, Sense8. Uh, but I feel like I've mentioned that before or maybe it's because I've seen him in something else. I feel like there was something else I saw him in. So I don't know whether it's because his characters popped up before in this or just I've seen that actor in something else, too, where I referenced that. But nevertheless, um the fact is that he ended up getting murdered. I'm like, oh, this is all about Reddington. I was like, oh, the monkey mask and stuff like that. I'm like, oh, what is this all about? And it's interesting what this ends up turning into. It all turned, because in the long run, because even Reddington, because it's interesting, because I, I was thinking the same thing Reddington was. He was like, the fact of the matter is the timing's a little too perfect. Harris, his one supporter in this whole situation, because everyone else is kind of, you know, in his vote to kind of be against him. So, lo and behold, it's like, they must have killed him because of that. So, but ultimately, we end up finding out later on Reddington uh, correlated the person putting him in jail, the one who put in the anonymous tip, as being the same person who went after um, Harris. He thought they were the same person. We, as the audience, know no, that's not the same person. Because we know that Liz and Jennifer are the people that locked him up in the first place. They had nothing to do with the whole Harris situation, but it's just interesting that uh, he went about this. And it's kind of interesting because there's that whole conversation between Reddington and Dembe. It's like, okay, try and get that guy on our side. If he's not going to be on our side, just kill him if that needs to be. And he's like, what else? It's like, well, we'll, we'll see from there. He's like, what else? It's like, I only told you to come here to, you know, to pray for my soul as an excuse just to get you here so I can tell you this. But he's like, yeah, but I'm also going to, you know, pray. You know, Reddington's like, I make my own fate. And it's like, yeah, if you, and Dembe's like, yeah, if you were out Side. But in here, you kind of have to leave it up to fate yourself. The fact of the matter is, he's like, tell Liz the truth. And he's just like, no, no, no. And he's like, tell Liz the truth. The fact of the matter, you know, Reddington's still in that position, kind of being a control freak that he is. Like, he cannot let this secret go, whatever it is that he's still hiding from her. That Dembe's telling him, tell her now. You know, kind of, because... I think Dembe is also pointing that in the direction of potentially like tell her when while you have the chance because you might not get you know it's like I'm trying to save your soul in case this potentially doesn't work out because even Dembe is looking at like because you can tell Reddington's trying to keep the faith up but even he's kind of like I don't know if this is going to work out and even you know Dembe probably part of him thinks that it probably won't work out either. But, um, yeah, you know, the FBI is looking into all this, and it turns out that this whole thing is a, a scheme. Uh, interestingly enough, like his brother in law, Tim's brother in law in this situation, uh, Marcus, uh, that's the same actor who played uh, Cade in Blindspot, you know, just NBC show. I just, just, just thought, thought it was kind of interesting. But nevertheless, it's like this large scam that they were working, like his girlfriend, his sister, and her, his sister's husband are all people who belong to this company called Ultra Ego. Basically, there's a thing like this. It's kind of like, it's almost like an escort situation, but not the whole sexual thing. It's more like, hey, we'll, you know, craft this fake partner for you, you know, to create, you know, or not just even partner because they even do the situation. Someone in your life, when you're trying to fill a void in your life and you just, you know, there's a role in your life that you want someone, an actor to play. Like, there, there, it's not even just the escort situation because obviously that plays inside like the girlfriend experience type of thing. But like, there is real stuff like this in real life too, where there's um, companies, sites, apps and stuff like that, that do stuff like this. So people will stop breathing down your neck and particularly like the guy in particular, like he hired, you know, Deidre uh, to pretend to be his, you know, getting married so his parents would get off his back and so they wouldn't be as, you know, quote unquote, ashamed of him because he's gay and they have such a problem with that in their eyes. It's wrong. But it all turns out that this was about getting his money. That's the crazy thing about this. Harris just happened to coincidentally die because the dude, Marcus, he got a little antsy. He didn't want to wait for his money because they were like, yeah, Harris was already sick and he was about to die soon. So he would have kicked the bucket eventually, but he couldn't wait. So he escalated things and not only killed him, but killed his wife and their guests as well, just to be an asshole. Um, 
I almost was wondering if Deidre was going to have second guesses about it, but it's like, in the end, she was like, nope, she was all about it. I was wondering, it's like, oh, his Tim's fake sister, it, the way she had the look on her face, is she having second? Nope, she's going through with it, too. Because even Deidre's the one that's like, oh, when it's, it's all this and that, oh, I, you might not have a will and stuff, but I'm pregnant with your baby, and in fact, it matters who has sole custody, me, that money's mine, blah, 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 and evil, 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 and I was like, man, I thought there might have been some semblance of regret. It's like, man, you greedy SOBs. Luckily, Liz and Rustler got there in time to kind of save the day, but man, that sucks. It sucks too for um, Tim because his entire world came crashing down because, you know, for him it's like like he thought he had a family, you know, and then it turns out it was all a lie. And Liz can, you know, in her current situation, she's like, I completely understand. You know, it's like you wanted to believe the lie. You wanted to have a family. Up to this point, Liz never had a family. Like the only person in her life she ever had was Tom. You know, she had, you know, her not real fat father Sam, but still, like, knowing, like, oh, Reddington's my real dad. It's like, oh, here's latching on to some, some part of the real me, you know, some connection, some from, uh, blood familial connection. That's what, what's kind of, you know, drives her, you know, the driving force between her and Reddington and, you know, her eyes and stuff like that. But that's just one side of things. Another side of things is the whole courtroom thing. Man, oh man, was Reddington on his game, dude. He tore Baldwin up being like, the fact of the matter is, like he was getting mad that Baldwin was like, because he was like, oh yeah, the Navy suit. He's like, action, objection. It's not actually Navy. It's just like the way the light hits it. It looks a little plum. And then like, you know, uh, Baldwin had brought up like a bulge or something like that. And he's like, um, can you ask him not to talk about any of like my bulge or whatever and just avoid all that whole conversation? But Reddington kind of tore into him being like, the fact of the matter is, you know why you got pissed? It's because you didn't like have, you know, you didn't really know anything. He's like, the fact of the matter is, that ID, that fake ID I had, which you didn't know was fake at the time, is super good. It's literally made by one of the best people in the world. There's no way you of all people would have been able to see through that. He even brings it up later on. It's like, that ID was so damn good, I started believing I was George uh, Murphy. It's like that, and he was riling up Baldwin and being like, oh... So now we get to see the real Officer Baldwin. The fact of the matter is, you're getting all riled up. It's because I didn't listen to you. I didn't show you respect. So you were going you know, to teach me a lesson, essentially. And that's what this was all about. So Reddington, you know, still continuing to try and not um, allow the gun into evidence. I even love the judge being like, you know what this means if things go wrong for you. And Reddington's like, come, why are you, come on, judge. I'm already on t and pins and needles don't make this worse for me and did like obviously making light of the situation but when it was all said and done like uh reddington kept pushing like hell bringing up the fact is that you know even trying to slyly be like yo how do we know this recording actually exists that he based it his whole you know search and seizure on and to be fair, the judge even agreed, like, okay, honestly, I got to give it to him because the government has been super shady because he's like, literally, the government literally lied about having their uh, immunity deal with me, and that turned out to be true. So, and but the judge was like, I'm not stupid. I'm not going to let you get that recorded. I'm going to, you know, check it out for myself. And, and she does, and it's being allowed in. So Reddington won't get to hear it for himself, but ultimately, once again, he comes up with that defense, and I love Reddington going all out, being like, the fact of the matter is, I didn't show him respect, and so, you know, because it's like, how can we trust the validity of this call? It wasn't vetted, you know, there was nothing ahead of time to be like, oh, this is a trusted source that, you know, was there enough there for him to kind of go off the way he did? It's like, no, he went off the way he did because I disrespected him. The fact of the matter is I have a tendency of doing that, saying stuff that I immediately regret. It's something, it's one of the big things that come up, you know, in therapy, along with stuff from childhood, as well as some sexual fantasies that I won't get into. We'll, we'll save those for chambers. Uh, but the fact of the matter is just being like because for him because even the officer Baldwin being like oh yeah he looked a little nervous he's like what do you mean look nervous dude he's like I've been literally running from the cops from law enforcement for 30 years and you think I'm nervous because of you get real even being like oh the person uh knew exactly what I was holding a concealed weapon why would they know I had a concealed weapon that's the whole point of it being a concealed weapon even being like 
Uh, the fact is that he could represent himself because the judge knows all about the law. He's like, I spent my entire life breaking the law, so of course I know the law. So, which he kind of he quoted like a, a law or something like that. And it's like, oh, Reddington does know this stuff. But a lot of it is kind of a bit of a Hail Mary in every move. And But sadly, when it was all said and done, the judge is like, the fact of the matter is it stays in. The gun is allowed as evidence. But even the judge is like, honestly, Reddington you did a good job on your own, like, handling things. I mean, it doesn't amount to much, you know. Even Reds is like, well, I, I'm glad at the very least I get that at the end of all this. But it's like, yo, he fought tooth and nail. He did such a damn good job. But at least to an end conversation with Liz that I thought was so interesting, she's like, I heard in every, about everything. And, you know, Reddington's like, either I'm slipping or the person I'm up against is super good. Because he was like, I was so certain Harris and me being locked up where that's you know it was connected when in actuality it's not um it's actually kind of something interesting because liz the entire time has been stressing about this because no matter what like i don't think this is her trying to pretend to be the concerned daughter there is a part of her yes she wanted him out of the way so they can do what they need to do look into things but there's still a part of her that cares about reddington like she might not believe she's thinking he's not her dad but there's still some part of her right now that you know she built a relationship with him before finding out. You know, she had her suspicions before, but that was kind of taken away. But then, like, the fact of the matter is she was, you know, they kind of had a bond already. But, you know, finding out he's her dad just solidified that. But I think what was already there as a foundation is, I mean, but that's the kind of thing. It, that kind of throws everything, even their foundation, into question about, like, all he's done is lie to me over and over and over again. And he might be hiding the biggest secret of all for me. So that's the whole situation. In that regard, so once again, kind of bringing out why I believe Liz is kind of super conflicted, and rightfully so. So that's interesting. But I, I truly believe there was a part of her that was actually concerned because it's like, I want you out of the way. I didn't want you to literally go towards execution because, in fact, the matter is she has to find out the truth. But it's not just about that because she does legitimately care about him. But Reddington's being like, no matter where I am when this is all said and done, I haven't heard the recording, but I will eventually. And I'll find out who betrayed me. And the fact of the matter is, you know, when it's all said and done... You know, whether, wherever I am, whether I'm out there in here, confinement, about to, you know, stand before a bull, you know, hailstorm of bullets, they, you know, he was basically going to make them pay and them suffer. And it's like, jeez. And you can see the Liz. I think Liz is a little scared because she knows Reddington will have that reach. Once again, look at Mr. Taplin. See what he did to Kate, the person that has been his biggest confidant. Over all these years, and he attempted to kill her because of her betrayal. Her betrayal wasn't... I, I, it depends on your scale of betrayals of, like, which is worse. What Liz is doing right now, or what uh, Kate did. It's kind of hard to say, like, for sure, you know? They're both kind of bad in their own right, but still. That is such an interesting development. I'm so curious to see what Liz ultimately does with this like i'm curious to get like an even bigger reaction from her like to see how she really feels with all of this like you know i want to get some conversations between her and jennifer about this whole thing you know is she going to try and find a way out for reddington because i think there was a part of her that thought like no matter what happens like reddington's just going to like he'll he'll find his way out of this or at the very least maybe i'm completely wrong and liz is like he needs to be here because it's like you know if it turns out the truth is you know obviously he isn't my dad and stuff like that once i found out the truth he can rot in it. i don't know like i said She's conflicted, you know, so it's definitely going to be interesting to kind of dive deeper into that. Um, what's also interesting is obviously this kind of whole episode kind of themes around truth in, really, in many regards because you have someone like Wrestler who is all about the truth and stuff like that because he's like, I'm awesome on my own and I'm not going to hide the truth because he's going to his cousin's wedding. But we see him at the end going to um, Alter Ego to get someone to go with him. So there's that. But it's also ties in because there's like there's Samara's story because she's working on word games to kind of help with her condition, but she's not telling anybody. And Aram is like, oh, let's play together. She's like, no, I'd rather play by myself, not telling him, because not telling him, not telling anybody. But at the end, she does, you know, send him one, just being like, you know, kind of being all cute and everything. Because I think she's keeping this from him, but she doesn't want to, like, completely push him away, obviously. So it's like maybe she thinks also playing with someone else will kind of keep her on her toes and keep her, her mind, you know, going and, you know, kind of, like, slow the progression of everything down, potentially, you know, so, 
I am curious to see when that's all going. I was thinking like maybe in her frustration she was going to end up telling Aram, but if she told him, eventually it'd probably most likely come out to everybody else, and I'm sure she doesn't want that because she she won't you know be allowed to do her job, and the fact that the matter is she doesn't want everyone kind of probably potentially looking at her like they should be concerned about her. So, like I said, some very interesting uh, progression in this episode, and I'm very interested and excited to see where everything takes us. I didn't even talk about the fact of the matter is what Dembe said of like you went looking for an enemy but you found a friend because Tim is, Tim is taking over for Harris as being like his representative so he's there to kind of shift the vote to be like hey my dad voted for Reddington and so will I. So that's that's kind of interesting that uh, Tim is getting kind of thrown neck deep into you know kind of thrown to the sharks and the wolves himself but we'll see kind of how that all plays out and I, I wonder will we get more interactions between Reddington or you know Reddington slash Dembe because Dembe is kind of acting on his behalf with Tim or not we'll just have to wait and see I'm excited to see what the next episode has in store for us with all of this and let's not forget the biggest thing too. Where the hell are things going from here? Like, everything's already not looking good for Reddington, and it's like everything's going to be pushing forward with the trial, and then when that's all said and done, we're going to, you know, especially because uh, Seema is, like, hell-bent on being like, yep, yep, let's get right to it, set him up for execution and stuff like that. So it's definitely very interesting to see where that's going to go. So, But really, that's all I want to talk about. Till the next time we meet, be happy, be safe, love light to the fullest, and enjoy it. Good day and good day. Good.